Topic number seven, X-ray diagnostics for diseases of bones and joints. Lecturer Shevchenko Alexander, Baltic Federal University Medical Institute, Kaliningrad 2020. Bone anatomy. Most bones develop from cartilaginous ossification centers which form either a diaphysis shaft or an epiphysis end. During bone growth, the diaphysis and epiphysis are separated by the growth plate also known as the epiphyseal line of or physis, which fuses later in life. The zone adjacent to the growth pellet on the diaphyseal side is called the metaphysis. When describing the location of a bone abnormality within a growing bone, you can refer to its position in the diaphysis, metaphysis or epiphysis. It is also correct to use simple descriptive terms such as shaft, proximal, distal and Cortical medullary articular surface. Sesamoid. A sesamoid bone is a bone that ossifies within a tendon. The largest is the patella. Sesamoid bones are also present at the first metatarsophalangeal joint in big toe and the first metacarpophalangeal joint thumb. Apophysis. An apophysis is a normal development or outgrowth of a bone which arises from a separate ossification center and fuses to the bone later in development. An apophysis usually does not form a direct articulation with another bone at a joint, but often forms an important insertion point for a tendon or ligament. Occasionally, an apophysis can persist into adult life and if injured may become symptomatic. The many apophyses in the body have variable appearances and are often mistaken for fractures. Bone anatomy example knee. Diaphysis, metaphysis, epiphysis, sesamoid bone, growth plate. Cortex and medulla example tibia and fibula. Cortex is denser, whiter here, and medulla is thinner. Descriptive terms. One the skeleton is fused, the distinction between epiphysis, metaphysis and diaphysis becomes less clear, and it's clinically less important. Less specific terms can be used to describe the, the location of an abnormality. Shaft, neck and head, distal articular surface, proximal articular surface and base. Metacarpal bone example. The metacarpal bone shown has a base, shaft, neck and head. Less specific terms may be appropriate such as proximal or distal end. Many bones also have proximal and distal articular surfaces. When describing abnormalities of an articular Surfaces remember to mention whether it is proximal or distal end. Joint anatomy. For example, we have knee. Certain periarticular soft tissues such as ligaments and tendons or even cartilaginous structures such as a meniscus can be seen on X-ray. If there is narrowing of a joint, this implies abnormal thinning of cartilage. So here we have joint space. Here, cartilage, and this is joint soft tissues. But if you need to scrutinize uh, cartilage structures such as meniscus, you need to do MRI. Systematic checklist. Patient, details of the patient and image details. Bone and joint alignment, joint spacing, cortical outline, bone texture, and soft tissues. Patient and image details. Start by checking or looking at the correct image. The patient details should be checked at the date and the time of the X-ray noted. The skeletal system is symmetrical, so it is particularly important to be sure you are looking at the correct side. Weaving principles. Confidence in assessing musculoskeletal system X-rays comes from experience and the knowledge of normal appearances. All patients are different, so being sure of the distinction between normal and abnormal is often difficult. 
Here are some principles that may help you to determine if a finding is normal. Two views are better than one. Check all available images. Compare with the other side, if imaged. If available, always compare with the old X-rays. Scrutinize at least two views. In the context of trauma, at least two views of the body part in question are usually required. If looking for specific disease entities, for example, erosions in rheumatoid arthritis, this may be less important. In some cases, such as possible scaphoid injury, more than two images are required. Here we have two planes, anterior posterior view and lateral view. And on the uh, anterior posterior view we have less obvious destruction of the fibula, distal end of the fibula. And in the lateral view we have very obvious uh, broken bone. Broke bone. Compare with the other side. Images of the asymptomatic contralateral side to a suspected abnormality are not routinely acquired for assessment of all bones and or joints. If an old image of the contralateral side is available, or if the other side is included as standard, for example, hip, pelvis, then comparison between symptomatic and asymptomatic appearances can be very helpful. Right this left example, pelvis and hips. When you have patient who can complain to the pain in the left hip or oh, right hip, you can you know where you want to look. So I think you didn't make this mistake. Compare current with previous images. The old X-ray is said to be cheapest test in radiology. If you are uncertain of abnormality and there is an old image available of the area in question, then always look at it. Doing this often increases diagnostic confidence and can show progression of pathology over time. Here we have pathologic rupture because we have here one part of the bone with lens a less denser part of the bone here. Keeping your eye on the ball, it means when you need to think about what the major complaints of the patient. Remember, you must treat the patient and not the x-ray. So we have, see here, huge uterine which was calcified. And when I say to you, keep your eye on the ball, I mean we have hip fracture. Large calcified uterine fibroid and loss of normal cortical control of the femoral neck. Mm -hmm. Image quality. The acquisition of many X-ray images requires careful pain positioning, which may not be possible due to pain or reduced patient cooperation. High quality images may not be achievable, in which case you will have to work with the images provided. If an image is suboptimal, you can ask the radiographer if there are your particular technical reasons for this. Requesting a repeat image may be reasonable if clinically justified. Artifact. Musculoskeletal system X-rays may demonstrate internal artifact, for example, due to previous orthopedic surgery or foreign bodies relating to an injury. If there is external artifact that, uh, that obscures the area of anatomical interest, then if possible, this should be removed. Bone and joint alignment. Loss of alignment may be due to a bone fracture or a joint dislocation. Both are associated with soft tissue injury that may be not be directly visualized.
So we have seen here a lot of alignment of the uh, third uh, metacarpophyll angular joint of the left uh, foot. Joint spacing. Joint spacing may be narrow due to cartilage loss or widened due to dislocation dissociation. Here we have loss of joint spacing. Here we have no joint space at all. Cortical outline. Careful scrutiny of the bone cortex is required because a check that is too brief will lead to incorrect or incomplete diagnosis. In the context of trauma, the clinical features of a significant injury may be masked by other injuries. Remember to be systematic, and if you spot one abnormality, do not stop until you are sure you have focused on all areas of anatomy shown. So, we begin to search what's wrong with the bone here, here, oh, 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 here is good, bone not broken and on the fourth bone we have example of the ruined bone cortex it causes a boxer's fracture because very often when people fight with their fist they have this fracture. Look at the normal bone texture. In some bones a thin matrix of thin white lines, trabecula is thin. Occasionally bone injury or disease will result in abnormality of this texture. Soft tissues. Scrutinizing the soft tissues can often provide helpful information. Not uncommonly, an abnormality of soft tissues is more obvious than a bone injury, or may even imply bone injury that is not visible at all. So, you must compare this film with the previous one. This is the blood, and this is the site of the bone fracture. This is normal anatomy of upper limb bones. Shoulder, shoulder girdle have the scapula, the collarbone, humerus, forearm bone, the ulna and the radius. The eight carpal bones are the bones of the wrist, scaphoid, lunate, triquetral, pisiform, trapezium, trapezoid, capitate, hemate. The five metacarpals 1 to 5 are the bones of the metacarpus, the phalangeal are the bones of the digits. This is a quick recap of the normal bone anatomy of the upper limb. Clavicle. The clavicle is the most proximal bone of the upper limb and provides leverage, uh, leverage and support for the shoulder girdle the structures. Uh, here's we see normal clavicle and he, here if we scrutinize the cortex of the bone we have see here site of the fracture acromioclavicular joint the acromioclavicular joint can be assessed with standard shoulder x-rays loss of alignment of the inferior surfaces of the clavicle and acromion indicates disruption of the acromioclavicular ligaments at the acromioclavicular joint Minor ligamentous disruption may not be detectable on a plain radiograph as alignment is not lost. More severe injury can result in additional disruption of the clavicular ligaments. What's wrong on this plain film? I give you a 10 seconds to understand what's wrong here. Of course, it's loss of alignment here and here. A 
Acromia clavicular joint disruption. The inferior surfaces of the clavicle and acromion are not aligned, indicating disruption of the acromioclavicular ligaments. The coracoclavicular distance is also wide, indicating coracoclavicular ligament injury. Normal shoulder joint. The shoulder joint is more accurately termed the glenohumeral joint. In the context of the trauma, there are two standard views used to assess this joint. These are anterior-posterior view and the lateral or Y view. Normal Y view. The Y view is so named because of the Y shape of the scapula formed when looking at it laterally. So we have Y view. Shoulder dislocation. Shoulder dislocation is a term often used loosely to indicate dislocation of the hand of the humerus from the lenoid of the scapula. The shoulder can dislocate posteriorly, but anterior dislocation is approximately 50 times more common. Scapula. Check the scapula carefully in the context of trauma. Scapula fractures are relatively uncommon. Careful attention should be paid to the standard shoulder's view as scapular injuries are often found when not suspected clinically. Subtle fractures are easily missed if care is not taken. So here we have superior border, medial border, lateral border. This is the body of scapula neck and glenoid fossa. Coracoid process and acromion spine. This is fracture of the scapula. Bony Bancroft fracture. There is often an injury to the glenoid cartilage as a result of shoulder dislocation. This is known as a Bancroft lesion and is not visible on X-rays. Occasionally there is visible injury to the bone glenoid, often called a Bony Bancroft lesion. This fracture is most often seen on an X-ray taken following reduction of a glenohumeral joint dislocation. A bone fragment is seen lying adjacent to the incomplete rim of the glenoid. Ring. Humerus. The surgical neck is a commonest site of humerus fracture. Fractures of the humerus are common at the surgical neck. A fracture line may extend into the humerus head with separation of the tubercles. tubercles. Fractures of the humerus shaft are not uncommonly due to the uh, a pathological lesion. Distal fractures are considered with the elbow. Humerus fracture. This is pathological view due to the lack of the density of the bone. And this is proximal end of the bone, bone shaft um, break bone. Elbow. An awareness of normal X-ray appearances of the elbow is essential for the identification of elbow injuries. Elbow injuries often have characteristic radiological appearances, which may only be de detected by the presence of soft tissue abnormalities. There are important considerations when dealing with elbow injuries in children. Order or of elbow ossification center development. Capitulum or capitulum, radial head, internal epicondyl or medical or medial epicondyl, trochlea, oligrenin, and lateral or external epicondyl, mnemonic critol. So we here see epicondyls, oligrenin. You must look precisely. We don't see the lateral epicondyl. It is not ossified yet because this is young person, too young. This part is not ossified. Normal elbow X-ray appearances. On the lateral image, there is often a visible triangle of low density lying anterior to the humerus. 
This is an fat pad with which lies within the elbow joint capsule. This is a normal structure. Anterior humerus line. A line extending from the anterior edge of the humerus should pass through the capitulum. With at least one third of the capitulum seen anterior to it. Radiocapitular line. A line taken through the center of the radius should extend so it passes through the center of the capitulum. Raised fat pad sign. If the anterior fat pad is raised away from the humerus, or if a posterior fat pad is invisible between triceps and the posterior humerus, then this indicates a joint effusion. In the setting of trauma, this is due to hemorrhosis. Blood is in, in, in the joint capsule. Secondary to a bone fracture. This is often the only X-ray sign of a bone injury. A post-traumatic effusion without a visible bone fracture usually indicates a radial head fracture in an adult and a supercondylar fracture of the distal humerus in a child. If there is a joint effusion but no history of trauma, an inflammatory cause should be considered. Here we can see raised fat pad and posterior fat pad. The radial head may dislocate from the capitulum of the humerus on its own or in combination with dislocation of the ulna from the trochlea. The later is usually straightforward to identify, but radial head dislocations may be more subtle. The role to remember is that the middle of the radial shaft, the radiocapitular line, should pass through the midline of the capitulum. Elbow X-ray, radial head dislocation. Radius and ulna. Typical fracture patterns arise in the forearm bones depending on mechanism of injury and the age of the patient. In the elderly, osteoporotic uh, fractures of the distal radius are common. In children, bone compliance loss for buckle or green stick type injuries. Many fractures of the forearm have eponymous titles. Use of these terms often leads to confusion and so should be used with caution. caution. Uh, about green stick type injuries, we have bone and this bone is broke like this. This is called green stick injuries. Why it's called green stick injuries? Because children bones is too elastic. Not so many mineral compound in the bone, so it can um, look like green stick fracture. Distal radius fracture and dorsal displacement. Transverse fracture of the distal radius, dorsal angulation and displacement of the wrist results in a so-called uh, dinner fork deformity. Shortness results in a uh, very narrowed ulnar carpal space. The injury of a similar most common in elderly osteoporotic woman is often referred to as a coles fracture. Dinner fork because hand of these humans look like this. Distal radius fracture, palmar displacement, palmar or volar displacement and angulation, short net radius. This injury is often referred to as a reverse colus fracture or Smith fracture. Forearm fracture dislocation. The radius and ulna form an anatomical unit joined throughout their length by an anterosseous ligament and stabilized at the elbow and wrist, thus forming a ring. If there is a fracture of the shaft 
of one of these bones with visible shortening, there is will likely be dislocation at the wrist or elbow of the other. If the ulnar shaft fractures this shortening, then the radius will dislocate at its point of weakness at the elbow, Mantegia fracture dislocation. If the radius fracture with shortening, then the ulna will dislocate at its point of weakness at the dorsal radial ulnar joint, Galeazzi fracture dislocation. Here on the film you see forearm fracture with dislocation of the proximal uh, end of the ulna uh, of the uh, radius. And here we see probability of getting Montagi or Galeazzi fracture. Look at the pattern of the bone here and here. Wrist. The standard wrist views are posterior anterior and lateral. In certain circumstances, further views are helpful so that the eight overlapping bones are more easily seen. The wrist comprises the scaphoid, lunate, triquetrum, pisiform, trapezium, trapezoid, capitate, and hemate bones. The radiocarpal, distal, radial, and carpal, metacarpal joints can also be considered part of the wrist. When assessing the wrist, it is important to assess the bones and the joint space separating them. It is the picture of normal uh, bone of the hand anatomy. So if you need, please make pause and look at to it precisely. This is normal wrist bones on X-ray. Trapezium, trapezoid, capitate. Hemate, hook of hemate, pisiform, triquetrum, lunate and scaphoid moon, posterior anterior view. And lateral view, trapezium, trapezoid, capitate, triquetrum bone, scaphoid, pisiform, lunate and radius. If you need some time, please make pause. Scaphoid fractures. The scaphoid bone is the most commonly fractured wrist bone. X-rays are, are indi indicated if there is post-traumatic wrist pain with anatomical snuff box tenderness. In this case, two extra views are added to standard views, oblique and posterior anterior with owner deviation. Hand and fingers. The hand comprises the metacarpal and phalangeal bones. Fractures and dislocations are usually straightforward to identify, so long as the potentially injured bone is fully visible in two planes. Finger joints commonly dislocate and are susceptible to avulsion injuries. Standard views are posterior anterior, oblique and lateral. On this picture we have the uh, loss of alignment and Dislocation of the proximal phalanges. Avulsion. This was the part of the uh, distal phalange of the finger uh, is broke. Normal anatomy of the lower limb. Uh, all who need make pause and read this. Hip bone, femur, tibia, fibula, tarsals, metatarsals, and phalanges. Hip fracture. Fractures of the proximal femur of hip are common clinical occurrence in the elderly. Osteoporotic patients. Many hip fractures are clinically and radiologically obvious. Others are more difficult to diagnose. It is important to be aware that the common clinical sign of a shortened and externally rotated leg may be absent if the fracture is not displaced. In this case, the X-ray may not show an obvious fracture. Repeat X-rays, CT or MRI may be required if pain persists. Particular care is needed in assessing the X-ray when physical examination is limited, for example, if a patient is accurately confused. Standard views. 
anterior posterior pelvis and lateral hip. The anterior posterior of the whole pelvis not shown on the X-ray on the on this page should be fully assessed because pelvic fractures can mimic the clinical features of a hip fracture. Normal anterior posterior view. Shenton lie is formed by the medial edge of the femoral neck. Sorry and the inferior edge of the superior pubic ramus. Loss of contour of Shenton's line is a sign of a fractured neck of femur. Important note, fractures of the femoral neck do not always cause loss of Shenton's line. Superior pubic ramus. Is here spine acetabulum? Femoral head, greater trochanter, femoral neck, lesser trochanter. Ischial tuberosity and femoral shaft. Normal lateral view acetabulum, ischial tuberosity, head of the femoral neck, trochanters, and shaft. The capsule envelops the femoral head and neck. You must always understand it because we have two types of major bone, bone of the fractures, intercapsular and extracapsular. Subcapital, transcervical and base cervical fractures are intercapsular hip injuries. Intertrochanteric and subtrochanteric fractures do not involve the neck of femur. Intracapsular fracture, subcapital anterior posterior view. You see two major signs here. First of all, loss of Shenton's line, and se second one, bone overlapping. Intracapsular fracture or subcapital fracture. Garden classification. First, incomplete or impaced bone injury with valgus angulation of the distal component. Second, complete, a cross whole neck undisplaced. Third, complete, partially displaced. Fourth, complete, totally displaced. Hip dislocation. The femoral head lies superior and lateral to the acetabulum. No associated fracture is visible in this case, but significantly soft tissue injury likely is likely. Femoral shaft fracture. Fracture of the femoral shaft usually result from high force impact, such as in a road traffic crash. Injury often results in highly displaced fracture, which are easily recognized both clinically and radiologically. If there is a fracture of the femoral shaft without a history of high force trauma, then the possibility of a pathological fracture should be considered. Uh, you must remember that pathological fracture, its reason uh, of fracture not associated with trauma or injury. It may be metastasis or osteomyelitis or osteoporosis which leads to the uh, bone fracture. Ankle. Three bones of the ankle joint, tibia, fibula and talus. Ankle fractures are usually bony injuries involving the distal tibia, medial malleolus, or distal fibula, lateral malleolus. Occasionally, the articular surface of the talus can be injured. Here you saw normal ankle joint. This is lateral view of the normal ankle joint. And try to see what do you watch on this film. Uh, what do you see on this film? What pathology? It's very easy to understand that we have fracture in two sides. 
Structures and dislocation of the forefoot metatarsos and phalanges are usually straightforward to identify so long as the potential injured bone is fully visible in two planes. The contour of the bone cortex of all bones must be checked carefully. Standard views. Dorsal plantar and oblique are standard projections of the forefoot. If only a phalangeal fracture is suspected, then dorsal uh, plantar and oblique views of the toe can be acquired. Lateral views can also be helpful. This is normal picture of foot projections. So, these students who need make pause and look precisely on this picture. Thank you for your attention. Uh, I hope this video will be helpful for you. Goodbye.